so the title of my talk is about the worldwide trade in timber products and how difficult it is to identify uh, wood products, especially when they've been highly modified. Um, most of the people who've spoken today have uh, shown entire plants or animals, so it's not beyond the realms of possibility that you can put a name to something like that. But if you've just got a chunk of wood in front of you and you don't know where it comes from uh, or anything about its provenance, then it can be very difficult to put a name to it. And of course, with legislation of various kinds, um, you actually do need a name quite often. Um, with imported timber product, uh, products, there is legislation pretty well covering the whole world. In the EU, we have the European Union Timber Regulations, which came into force in 2013. Um, in the United States, we have possibly a, an even more... Uh, 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 an act with even more teeth than the EUTR, uh, called the Lacey Act. And there's a similar one in Australia as well, the Australian Illegal Logging Prohibition Act, which came into force in 2012. Now... All these legislations require importers to these countries to use due diligence to ensure that their timber products have been legally sourced. And that's, of course, a big problem. If it's a CITES-listed species and you don't have an export permit from the country of origin and an import permit where it comes in, then that's illegal. Um, if it's a piece of oak... That may or may not be illegal, depending on where it came from and what route it's taken to, to get here. But of course, the first thing to do is to actually work out what you've got in front of you. So um, I work in the Jodrell Laboratory at uh, Kew Gardens. I've worked there for many years on wood identification. And until these acts came into force, uh, generally the inquiries that I had to to do about identifying wood samples were not particularly onerous. You could get to genus and they'd be happy with that. Usually they would know where the sample came from and the two questions that are most important generally to people are where is it from and what is it. Uh, that has become increasingly difficult, especially uh, with uh, international trade. Um, so at Q, uh, our ability to do wood anatomy is well established. I'll show you some slides in a minute, uh, giving you more background on that. Uh, we have, or we have had chemists at Kew who are perfectly capable of extracting chemicals from wood samples and sometimes recognizing that they're new to science and uh, describe them as new structures. And I'll give you an example of that later on with uh, Dalberger Nigra, which is. Uh, one of the rosewoods on CITES Appendix 1. There's a, it's not a particularly new technique, but it's fairly newly being used to um, work on wood identification, and that's near-infrared spectroscopy. Uh, we're developing that technique at Kew, but people in Brazil in particular have been quite good at uh, using that to recognise Swietenia and uh, Cedrella and uh, other Meliaceae mahogany uh, species. Molecular techniques, now uh, uh, I think that could be a can of worms. Certainly I think with uh, heartwood, which is what is often in trade, uh, if there are any molecules in there or bits of DNA, they're going to be very badly mangled, um, hidden by high molecular weight compounds and so on. So rather difficult to, to deal with. So I've put in red here what I think the major limitation is when we try to identify wood samples. Uh, even though, as I'll show you in a minute, we've got some quite large, extensive wood collections in the UK, Europe, and around the world, quite a number of them don't have voucher specimens backing them up. So you might have a chunk of wood, but you may not have a herbarium voucher specimen. So if you suspect that it isn't what the label says, you're going to be hard pressed to prove or otherwise that it's something else. And the second limitation is that even if there was a comprehensive reference collection, 
which there isn't, to any of these uh, taxa that we're interested in. There's no single technique that can answer the identity problem. I think it's also worth mentioning here that there is a very big difference in terminology between biologists and people in the timber trade. So biologists, we know what we mean by genus and species. Someone from the timber trade might come up to me and say, can you tell me what species of wood this is? And I can tell him it's oak, and he's happy with that. That's not a species, that's a genus. There are 525 species of oak. So which one is it? Um, also, they use common names, often made up, and those common names are quite difficult sometimes to match with the scientific name, and you're not even sure you've matched the right one with the right one quite often. Um, I've got a book uh, in the lab about trees of Brazil, and virtually every common name has at least five or ten different species associated with it, depending on which bit of Brazil you were in. So it's, it's a bit of a can of worms dealing, dealing with names. Um, here, um, you can see once things become just bits of wood, they are much more difficult to recognize. I'm fairly sure that the tree on the left was a legume. I was standing next to the chap who owned that piece of forest in the Amazon, and he was quite disconcerted to find that someone had come along and pinched his beautiful tree. Um, this was taken in Ghana, and uh, the people I photographed with that tree seemed very unhappy that I was taking those pictures. So I wouldn't be at all surprised if that was illegally uh, obtained. So you've seen that picture top left before, but this is to put in context why we can do this kind of work um, at Q. That picture top left is of me in the mahogany uh, part of the uh, wood collection uh, in the Banks building at Kew. I don't know whether you can actually call that a museum because it's a collection. It's not open to the public. And so I was thinking when you were talking, uh, what's the difference between a museum and a collection? Presumably a museum has to allow people in to look at it. And we've got this massive collection. You can see uh, Kate in those two pictures there standing in front of um, a very large set of cabinets. They are fireproof cabinets which contain our massive microscope slide collection which numbers well over 100,000. And I like to think that if the whole building goes up in smoke and we all perish, then at least a slide collection will survive the experience and our successors, if there is anything like a professional biologist in the future, uh, will actually have the opportunity to, to look at these slides. And actually, one of the great things about working in a lab like the one I've spent my career in is that you make microscope slides, um, and they'll hopefully be there in 50 or 100 years' time. And maybe someone will look at the label and think, oh, Gasson, I wonder who he was. Maybe I can find out something about who actually made this <coughs> And on the left there, you'll see that uh, at the moment, I'm in the fortunate position of having two uh, sandwich students working with me. And they're working together, they're making some new slides of um, timbers that are in commerce from the Solomon Islands. Um, so those slides there are stained sections of Campnosperma on the left. Uh, bottom right, I'll mention this at the very end, we now have a digital slide scanner which can scan at very high resolution uh, entire sections. Um, I do have collaborators and uh, competitors. Um, although our slide collection is the only one that's really in any use in uh, the UK, there's a very big collection in Hamburg in, in Germany. And in fact, from the point of view of EU timber regulations, they are probably way ahead of anybody else in Europe when it comes to uh, actually helping to enforce them. And uh, Gerald, who's in that picture, is in the very fortunate position of having five people cutting sections for him all day long. So he's in a much better position than I am. 
Um, this slide actually gives you some indication of where the big collections are and how many specimens are in them. These numbers are samples, not taxa. So there might be a lot of replication in some collections and hardly any replication in others. But um, for many years, well decades actually, Madison in Wisconsin, the Forest Products Lab, had the largest uh, collection that was a worldwide basis. Uh, but you can see that um, the largest single collection now is in Leiden in Holland because they combined all their collections in Holland into one place. But if you look at the absolute size and you add all the collections together, Brazil, being one of the most biodiverse countries in the world, has, has by far the largest number of samples. I've put in red there, I think it's worth crowing that uh, our collection has grown by quite a large number uh, over the last few years. In fact, uh, maybe it would be worth discussing at the end the 7,500 specimens we've just taken on board. And there was certainly a bit of pain involved in deciding whether we could take those or not. The other two in red there, Garston, which was Prince's Risborough, and Oxford, they both have large collections, but they're really just sitting there. They're not, uh, not really being used. And that histogram, I think, tells quite an interesting story. I don't know whether you can read the dates, um, but the peaks, the two highest peaks, are the 1950s and 1960s. And if you think about that uh, from a British or a Dutch or a Belgian or a French perspective, you'd expect those collections, and they were inaugurated back in the 1800s rather than more recently, because they have a very long sort of colonial history. Uh, the ones that have been created since the war, uh, a lot of them are in places like Brazil, where there are large numbers of people still prospecting for, for wood samples. Now, of course, if you're a customs officer and you want to uh, check on an import, um, you might have the kind of problem that you can see here. Which container do you actually go for? And we've given customs officers some help for um, three things, like uh, big leaf mahogany here, ramen, and also uh, a thing called pericopsis, where we've made nice, pretty posters and uh, put them up in customs offices around the country. Uh, but you can see where the ports are. Places like Felixstowe and Liverpool are very large ports, and there's only one or two customs offices in each port who. Uh, have any kind of knowledge or interest in uh, timber imports. I think most of them would be more interested in booze and fags rather than, uh, than, than timber. And then they've got the problem, there's an awful lot of woods that look very similar to each other. So in that picture there, I would say that that Swietenia mahagoni and the Chia senegalensis look much more similar to each other than that the other two Swietenias do to the Mahagoni. And of course there's a lot of variation in colour depending on where the tree grew, whether you've got a lot of heartwood, how many extractives there are in the heartwood and so on. So it's not, not even looking like fingerprints, uh, fingerprints or something like that. You know, there's a lot of variation in wood, both in colour and in the structure when you get it under the microscope. And there have been various um, things happening fairly recently. It seems as though Indonesia and the EU have come to an agreement um, because Indonesia and uh, places like the Democratic Republic of the Congo uh, are notorious for being the sources of lots of illegally uh, cut timber. So here I've just got a short list of some of the taxa that uh, I think are of particular interest in the international timber trade. There are many more that you could probably think of. The rosewoods, Dalberger, that is pantropical. There are 250 species. Probably 60 odd are of commercial interest. There are 48 species in Madagascar alone, and they are all covered on CITES regulations. 
anatomically they're quite difficult they're all very difficult to tell apart we've got very little material as some of the madagascan ones so actually enforcing the legislation is pretty difficult because you might know that dalberga nigra is on cites appendix one but if you can't be sure that that chunk of wood in front of you is that species then how do you enforce the the law quercus um there are 500 odd species. When they come into contact, they're highly promiscuous, so you get lots of hybrids and introgression taking place. There is, there's one species that is of particular interest now, which is Quercus mongolica, which is CITES listed. That comes from the Russian Far East, just crosses one border into China, where it's turned into flooring or uh, furniture mixed up with Quercus alba from North America, Rober and Petraea from Europe. So it's a bit of a mess, especially when you can't actually anatomically separate that species from other white oaks. Palaquium, that was one I'd never heard of until I started looking at, uh, at face veneers on, uh, on plywoods. Campnosperma was another one in that category. I've mentioned mahoganies. If ever any diptrocarps appear on CITES, we're sunk, I think. The diptrocarps are the major um, commercial timber family from Southeast Asia. So quite a lot of the things that are called mahogany that you find in B&Q and so on are actually diptrocarps, shoria or diptrocarpus. And then I've got a short list there of some of the techniques available to us. I've mentioned some of them. Um, one of them, stable isotopes, has a lot of promise and has been used to actually nail the origin of particular samples. So the Quercus mongolica problem, it's one thing to say that it's oak, which is fairly straightforward. If you use stable isotopes, you can almost certainly tell whether it came from the Russian Far East or North America or Europe. So combining two techniques may well uh, be the answer there just want to show you how weird and wonderful hardwoods can be. Uh, so here, is this the central one? Yeah, it is. You've got vessels, which are the big holes. You've got fibers in all of them, differently stained, different stains. You've got rays, which run up and down. And you've got axial parenchyma, which are the thin walled cells in lines here, around the vessels there, and forming beds there under the vessels. So you've got four different cell types which appear in all sorts of interesting patterns. So you may never have heard of the Lecithidaceae, but that pattern is very distinctive for that family, and the Brazil nut is probably the best known member of that family. Um, although Brazil nut wood doesn't come into uh, our hands very often because the actual fruits are the things that are of more value to people. In the middle is a diptrocarp, which is one of the few hardwoods which has axial canals in it, which you can just about see if you look hard enough there. And then the pattern on the right is very, is virtually diagnostic for the family Proteaceae. So with a little bit of knowledge, you can get quite a long way, but you can't always, often can't get quite as far as the legislation would like. Conifers are much more boring. Um, they're very much more conservative in their anatomy. At least there are fewer species. There are only about 600 species of conifer. Um, on the left, you've got Douglas fir. Uh, in the middle, you've got yew. And on the right, you have something you may never have heard of, which is on CITES Appendix 1. It's a thing called a Lursi from the uh, family Cupressaceae from Chile. Interestingly, we identified some of that wood years ago. Well, I say interestingly. You might not think so. Um, uh, we... We identified a confiscated uh, shipment, identified it as that, customs confiscated it, and then down at Wakehurst they built a small school building out of the proceeds. So one could say it was in our interests to identify it. Um, we produced uh, in 1989 on the, on the hardwoods and, and 2004 on the softwoods, lists of the anatomical characters that are really useful for identifying timber species. 
uh, there have been lots of criticisms of these lists by people who like working on the armors and so on, but that wasn't really the, the point. And if you look, if you just put the two words inside wood on Google, your top hit will be the inside wood database. And uh, I think this is fairly recent, but we've got over 6,000 descriptions of modern woods on that and nearly 40,000 photographs. So it's quite a big, good resource. And virtually all, the, well, virtually all the commercial timbers and many things that are not commercial are on that. But it can be useful or it can only sometimes just give you an idea of what you have. So here you have three bits of wood side by side, longitudinal surfaces, which are indistinguishable to the trained eye. There's a list of characters at the bottom highlighting some of the very minor differences. So you can use it for inspiration, but not necessarily to get, get uh, right down to one answer. <coughs> Unless you're dead lucky with something like this. I, I use this now as... Uh, a, an example of how powerful that multiple entry key can be. So on the left we have this uh, this stem and you can see quite clearly there that it's got concentric rings of xylem and phloem. With a razor blade I cut a little bit of the surface and I could see the vessels were uh, solitary vessels. And the other thing I knew about it was that it came from Sri Lanka and was a medicinal plant. So we start off with almost 7,000 descriptions. So I put in character 133, concentric included flow, and that takes me down to 65 matches in one go. Then I put in character nine, solitary vessels, that gets me down to 19. And I look through the list and think, well, surely many spermaceae is the best bet there. But then I put in Sri Lanka and get one match, but there were no photos. So I just put that match into Google and immediately, bingo, the pictures are just like a chip off the old block. But uh, it's very, very unusual to uh, nail some. I thought, actually, when I got that to identify, I thought there was no chance whatsoever of getting that, but got it very easily. So let's get on to some plywood. Um, so as, as I said before, what is the wood and where is it from? With hardwood plywood that's manufactured in China, um, most inquirers are interested in the pinkish face veneers, which are about 200 microns thick. And if you think that sort of medium-sized vessels in wood are about 200 microns thick. Now, I've got in this bag here, I've got some examples. I'll, if anyone wants to have a look at some of these, uh, you'll see just how thin, thin they are. Um, the inner layers are often eucalyptus or poplar, poplar which are grown in... Um, in uh, China. And then here's a good example of an awkward name. Pencil cedar is palaquium in the Sapotaceae. Now to me cedar is either a conifer tree or the uh, cedars in the mahogany family, not something that's in the family Sapotaceae. So there's a problem with names. Um, another thing that it could be is Sterculia rhinopetala from the Cameroons. Another one, Campnos firma from the Solomons, Canarium from probably Indo-Malesia, or Sapili, which is another one of these mahoganies, uh, presumably from tropical Africa. And here are some edges of these, um, these plywoods. And on the left and right of each plywood, there is a thin layer which you can't see. And that's a couple of hundred microns thick at the most. Now, if any of you ever did any anatomy at school or anything, you'll know that if you have a tree trunk and you want to cut sections from it, you cut a cross section or a transverse section, then you cut a tangential, the tangent to the circle, and then you cut a radius, which is a radial section. And each of those three planes is at 90 degrees to the, to the previous one. But if you've got a very thin veneer that's 200 microns thick, the only section you can get is the face that you're looking at. And if you think that many sections uh, in slide collections are 20 or 30 microns thick, you haven't got much room for manoeuvre there. 
So either it's a good planar section that is useful or it's oblique and it's no use to you at all. So here are some of the faces. Um, one thing I think you should try and see is can you see in this one some very tiny brown dots? Well, they're the radial resin canals in some of the rays, which you can pick out uh, under the microscope, so long as you've got a canal in that tiny bit that you've looked at. So here, top left, that's a transverse section. In the middle is a tangential, and on the right is a radial. So those are the three planes of section you usually look at. Uh, but we've only got the tangential sections available to us from these face veneers. And that is because they're rotary cut, like that. So you look at the face and you can see you've got a tangential. So at least you've got one of the three planes of section that you need to use. And if they tell you what it might be, then at least you can compare it with that as a possibility. Of course, if it looks like it, then that's fine. You can say this matches our reference material of whatever. And we only ever say that. We never say it is anything. So if you come back to me and say, you told me that was oak, whatever, I'll say, no, I didn't. I said it looks like oak. So, and I'm sure the lawyers amongst us will recognize how good an idea that is. Um, but with, uh, with the palaquium, for example, before I knew for certain that this palaquium was coming from the Solomon Islands and there was a restricted number of possibilities there. I started looking it up in, uh, in uh, particularly in the plant resources of Southeast Asia, uh, timber trees, major commercial timbers, and you almost immediately feel as though you're walking in quicksand. So actually, palaquium is often known as Nyato from Asia, but also pencil cedar in Papua New Guinea and the Solomons. It's often mixed up with other members of the Sapotaceae. So there are 110 species of palaquium to start with, and then God knows how many other species of Ganua, which has now been sunk into Madhuka, Madhuka, Pyena, Planchinella, and Puteria. And even field botanists can't tell one Sapotaceae tree from another. So, uh, you know, where, where do you stand? And the problem with um, legislation, especially things like CITES, is it's species-based. So you're in a bit of trouble sometimes. This is, this is what happens in China with, uh, with tree trunks. They're turned into uh, veneers. Uh, and this is a thing I'd never heard of until recently. I'd heard of Melina arborea, but I didn't know it was called white teak. I don't know whether that's just made up or uh, whether it's traditionally been known as that. But the, before they make these plywoods, this is all poplar. This is the white teak at the back, and these are white teak tree trunks in China, having been imported from the Solomons. So we've, men we've heard mention of the National Measurement and Regulation Office, or Regulatory Office, which have now changed their name to BIS. Um, they are the uh, competent authority on timber in the UK, so they uh, will sometimes pretend to be a customer and buy a table, and then chop bits off it and send them to places like us. Although we now have to tender for this work, which means that DEFRA, which partly uh, uh, pays the NMRO to do this work and also supports Q, expects us to tender for their work, which seems like a bit of an ass to me. Um, but anyway, we get things like this. So this uh, T102.8, that's clearly a bit of oak veneer. But you look inside it, and uh, it's described as pine inside. And there isn't a single piece of pine in there. And in fact, if you look hard, you can see these solid wood pieces are actually a lot of different bits and pieces stuck together. This is a table leg, a solid oak table leg. Number three, which is the third gold-shaped gold piece down in the middle, is clearly a red oak. So presumably that comes from North America. The other bits, all the other 15 pieces in that photo, are white oaks. But as I alluded to earlier, 
do those white oaks come from Europe, America, or, or China? In fact, they could come from all three in one table leg. So that's where stable isotopes could well uh, give you the answer. And you might think, how on earth does he know whether it's a red oak or a white oak? Well, if you look on the left, that's a white oak, Circus rosa, and the lakewood vessels are thin-walled and angular, whereas uh, in the red oak, the lakewood vessels are thick-walled and circular. And that's a fairly consistent difference between red and white oak. This is Quercus mongolica, which is CITES listed. That's a white oak. So that could equally be Alba, Rhoda, uh, Petraea, or any number of other uh, white oaks. Um, this is what some of my colleagues do to guitars that are of suspect origin. Um, and actually, these, these things here, these are Dalberga um, uh, handles as well. So Dalberger, that's a big problem, as I've already mentioned. Um, the specimen bottom left was labelled Dalberger miscalobium on the label. It came from the Natural History Museum when they threw away their wood collection a few a couple of decades ago. Um, the, um, the collection was cherry-picked by Q, and the rest were sent up to Liverpool museum so the collection still exists but it's been dis dispersed so that dalberger miscalobium is actually dalberger nigra so it's labeled as an unprotected species but actually it's highly protected um, these are four transverse sections of, of different dalbergers but they all look much like this in tangential section but i've got some very clever colleagues um, Jeff Kite and Nigel Beach in particular are, are very good chemists, or one of them is no longer with us, but, uh, and they, they managed to uh, extract and isolate and find a, an entirely new compound to science called dalnigrin. And um, that is unique in the 16 species of dalberga that we looked at. Of course, we don't know what the other 234 have. Maybe they all have it. But um, that seems to be probably the most certain way of telling whether you've got this particular species uh, uh, as opposed to others. And Jeff said to me, uh, there's this massive table in the Banks Building Museum labelled Brazilian Rosewood, but I can't find Dalmigrin in it. So could you have a quick look at the anatomy and see whether it looks like a Dalberga? And it ain't Dalberga. It's uh, probably Hymenia, which is another legume, but it's not Dalberga. And then we've got um, a lot of entry books at Kew going back right to the beginning for the collections in the museum. And if you look back there, you find that this was sourced from a timber supplier in Derbyshire in the 1800s, and it said probably by a rosewood, which is Dalberga nigra. So that question mark at some stage got scrubbed out and the thing became definitely something that it wasn't. Um, this is perhaps a slightly unfair photo of Guy Clark, who's the uh, customs chap at uh, Heathrow, who does know how to use a, a hand lens. He was just lowering his head to it at the time. But these boxes are full of uh, blinds made in Indonesia and all of them were found to contain at least one piece of ramen. Now the great advantage with ramen, Gonistylus and the Timeliaceae, is that um, all the species in that genus are covered on CITES, I think it's Appendix 2. So wood anatomists can often get to genus, but getting to species is nigh on impossible. So so long as you can get to species, uh, to genus with this one, uh, you know uh, you're on the right track. If you look very carefully at this, uh, this surface, you'll see that uh, the vessels have wings coming out of them. They look a little bit like gumbo jets head on. And uh, I'm rather proud to be able to say that I actually managed to get uh, winged aliform parenchyma on BBC One once. Um, you don't hear that very often on the BBC. And this is what it looks like um, under the microscope 
transverse tangential and radial sections. And if you look at the bottom left radial section, you've got it, you can see it's got some fantastic little crystals in the ray cells, which are quite distinctive. And if you look at the blind on the right, uh, I must say I think it's a lot easier identifying the woods in the blind than it would be putting one up. But uh, you'll see here that is agathis, which is a conifer. This is probably ramin. And then if you run your eye down there, you can see that there are three or four different things in that particular blind. And I think what happens in these warehouse, in these places where they manufacture them, as long as the wood is the right has the right kinds of properties, you use it regardless of what it is. And ramin looks like a lot of other things, but if you get it under the microscope, as you can see here, um, all its own magnifications, you've got lots of different patterns. So the one on the left is a member of the Rubiaceae, the coffee family. Then you've got a thing called Jelutong, which is a well-known um, uh, Southeast Asian timber. And then you've got the Gonistylus, the ramin. And I, I won't go through all the characters, although I will say that the Jelutong has very large latex tubes in it. So if you cut that wood fresh, you'll get white latex pouring out of the wood. But we do have, uh, well, most of my career, we've had rather interesting inquiries like this particular one. I imagine this uh, Luo Han is extremely valuable, and the owner wanted to know what the wood was. So uh, he took a little piece off from the bottom, sent it to us, and I managed to identify that as Tilia lime. But the catch there is, then he comes back to me and says, can I assume this is tilia, I don't know, say, chinensis or something, there is, is such a thing. And I said, no, you can't assume that. I've identified it to genus, and that's as far as I can get. If you've got other information which will allow you to make that assumption, fair, fair enough. Now, I mentioned fairly close to the beginning that we are now in the process of uh, digitally scanning at high resolution. I wouldn't say every slide in our collection because we've sometimes got several slides that are identical, so every different slide in our collection. Uh, with well over 100,000 slides, the quality varies enormously from pretty useless to fantastic. And we have here Alicia, who uh, she's not a botanist, but she's, uh, she's got a degree in photography and she's really into all this digital um, imaging and so on. So just behind her, it doesn't show particularly well because it's white with a white background, is the Zeiss Axia scan, which can uh, scan 100 microscope slides, one after the other. And you can do that with a 5, 10, 20 objective um, and do Z stacking. She's usually doing it with 13 uh, stacks but to do it really well, you can do it with 26. But with the five times objective, 100 microscope slides take about 20 hours to scan. And each image, and bear in mind that each, set, each slide often has three sections on it, so each image is one of those sections, can be up to a gigabyte in size. Um, we haven't run out of space yet, but it won't be long. Oh, that's the wrong way, isn't it? And she put together you can see her artistic temperament there. Um, the section on the left is a really interesting thing. It's, it's called tetracentron, and it's one of very few uh, vessel-less angiosperms. For those of you who are interested in that characteristic, you've only got amborella, which is right at the base of the angiosperms. Then you've got winteraceae, and you've got tetracentron and trochodendron are closely related and that's it and if you look at a cladogram or a phylogeny of the flowering plants you can see amborella at the bottom winter ac part way up and trochodendron some distance apart so you wonder did we start off without vessels and a lot of things got them and then a couple more lost them or what, what's your um, hypothesis and then you'll see on the right some of the range of variety of um, sections we have in the collection. So you've got everything from unstained to heavily stained to light stained, good sections, bad sections. So it's um, 
it's not just a question of getting 100 slides, bunging them in the machine and uh, scanning them. It's much more difficult than that. And you've scanned the 100, you come in after the weekend and you find that 30 didn't do very well, so you've got to put them in again. So it's, um, it's a fairly big, big job. And I'm going to end on this one, I think, where this is how I feel sometimes when I'm trying to identify good samples. Um, it's often, you know, a lot of people seem to think it's a bit like working out the, the uh, concentration of sugar in a solution or something. They say, can you analyse this piece of wood? Well, when you say that, do you want me to find out how much carbon is in it or do you want to know what it is? And if they want to know what it is, sometimes it'll take me ages to work it out. Sometimes I never manage it. And sometimes I'm in the car or in the bath or somewhere else when inspiration comes. But that inside good database is, is a very, very good place to start. And it, even if you're only interested in wood from an aesthetic point of view, have a look at that because it's got some fantastic pictures in it. And I have no idea how long I've taken, but uh, I'll stop there.